thank you guys for coming. Uh, I'm gonna pop up the stack a little bit here, uh, talk about some of the patterns and concurrency that I've seen, uh, things that work for me in Go, um, things that I've seen work for my peers, and then more importantly, things that don't work. Um, everything I'm gonna talk about today is my opinion, obviously, um, but I think many will agree here. So uh, I do like soccer, thanks for saying, football, whatever. Um, I've been a database engineer at IronIO for like three months or four months or something. Been writing Go for a little over a year and a half. Um, most of that before Iron was hobby projects and such. Uh, I've contributed a little bit to a lot of things, I guess. Uh, a little bit of progression of the languages I've written. Uh, I still really love C++ just because I feel like uh, it's more complicated than my life. Uh, so it's crazy. Anyway, Go here. I'm really happy with Go. Um, and let's just dive into it. Uh, this title here was in the description of my talk. Um, this is not a ding on Go at all. Uh, Go actually has some obviously very powerful concurrency primitives. That's one of the biggest reasons why I love it. Um, today though, I'm gonna discuss how I think we should be using these primitives responsibly. Uh, many will disagree, some will agree. Uh, I'd love to have the discussion. Uh, so I'm going to really briefly just go ahead, I'm going to touch on mutexes, channels, weight groups. We all know how to use them. I'm going to just lay out a little bit of the conventions that I use for them. Uh, I'm going to go into a little bit more uh, detail on timeouts, how I do cancellation, how I use net context, um, which I'll show in a lot more detail if you haven't heard of it. Uh, and then there's a little special topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart for select loops. I'll explain those in a lot of detail at the very end. Uh, so first of all, locks. Um, they have a time and a place. I've seen a lot of literature on when to use them, when not to use them. Best tool for the job has been thrown around a lot there. Uh, they can be hard to use. Um, I just try to remember that. Uh, everyone probably remembers that. When you don't have a good convention on how to use locks, things go bad. Uh, in a lot of code that I've seen that uses channels to communicate between Go routines and then adds in a lock or vice versa. So they share memory by communicating and communicate by sharing memory. Things go bad or they can go bad. Uh, generally, as we all know, share memory by communicating is preferred, uh, not required. Uh, so here's what I've sort of come up with Go specifically. There's not much here. Um, obviously, when you defer on locking, even if it's a read-write lock, that's preferable. Uh, you don't have to remember, you can return in multiple places, etc. Um, the second two are basically just documentation points. Um, that last part's important. There's conventions from other languages, not saying we should all use them because they're other languages, they're not Go. Um, but the really important one here is the middle. Documenting ownership in your public interface is crucial if you're using mutual exclusion with locks. Um, it's really, really painful as a caller to a library or as a library implementer to have to remember, oh, do I need the guy to own this or do I need to own this before I call or vice versa. Um, to that point, if you can abstract that mutual exclusion into a higher level concept, um, some kind of uh, reservation ID or something like that, very, very useful to do. Here's an example. There's a lot to read here. Um, I'm going to just touch on a few little points here. Uh, this is just some generic interface that I came up with. It's modeled after some code that I've written at Iron. Uh, the basic idea is this is a map of string to whatever value you want. And instead of passing channels back in this case, and instead of requiring a mutex to be passed in or requiring ownership before someone calls one of the functions in this interface, uh, we just have this concept called a reservation ID. The reservation ID is just a little cookie that you get indicating that you have ownership. They can be expired with this guy, uh, and they can not exist. You can pass in a random old string, and you'll get an error out. Um, a few key points here. Um, we talk about what's going to happen if you don't have a reservation here. We talk about what happens if you are able to acquire the reservation. We talk about what happens if the reservation is not already held. There's a few other things here, but the primary goal of this illustration here is to tell the user what's going to happen if they don't own it, what's going to happen if they do own it, and what's going to happen after the action takes place. The action in this case is the function call. Moving on to channels, I'm going to go through some of these primitives a little quickly here. Um, we all know how to use channels in conjunction with Go routines. A lot of us know really well how to use select. Select is awesome as well. Uh, I read and heard somewhere from a lot of different people that uh, channels and Go routines don't really matter unless you have select. I agree. Completely agree. 
Um, particularly for channels here, they're built in to go for a reason. So let's try to use them by default. A lot of times when I've written programs, I fall back to the C days and I say, oh, let me get pthread, link pthread in. This is go, there's no pthread. But we do have sync mutex. I try to convince myself why I shouldn't use mutexes or read write lock and why I should use channels. Oftentimes for me, as a relatively new Go programmer, one and a half ish years, um, I have to flip my thinking around a little bit. It's that whole thing about sharing memory by communicating instead of the vice versa. So, some conventions. Um, it's really, really nice as a user of a library uh, to know when I make a function call that takes in a channel or returns a channel, what's it gonna do with that channel inside? I don't really wanna have to go look in the code, although I do, but it's really nice to know that in the documentation, it shows up on godoc.org, very nice thing to have. Secondly, very similar point, when we enlist the compiler by using directional channels, we can get the compiler to tell us things about how our program will or will not behave right when we build it, not after running or writing tests. So for example, the compiler will not let you close a read-only channel. And I'll show an example of what a channel, a directional channel looks like in a second. Uh, last two points there. Uh, we all know about close. We know what happens when we're trying to read from a closed channel. We know how to range over channels so that they close, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that one probably doesn't need a lot of explanation. The second to last one there, uh, in case you don't know what a generator is, uh, a generator is a function that returns a channel but starts up a Go routine inside of it to interact on that channel. Really, in my experience, that's the only useful thing to do in a function that returns a channel. There are others, but that's the real only widely used practice. The reason is because if you return a channel from a function and that function expects to do some interaction on the channel, you might get a deadlock. It might be very easy to get a deadlock because if function is doing something on the channel, you haven't gotten it back to listen or write to that channel. It's kind of ill-defined by default what's going to happen because the library author hasn't told you what's going to happen. Go defines it very well, but the library author may not have. So here's a little bit of an example. Um, this is taken from an ID tracking system for incoming requests to a service. Uh, it's a little bit abstract, but it, it proves, uh, doesn't prove, shows the point a little bit. Uh, if you don't know, directional channel right there, it's a, re, it's a write only channel, so that means watch changes will only be able to write on that channel. Uh, we talk about what happens if the request isn't reserved in watch changes. We talk about what happens uh, in interaction on that channel that you pass to watch changes. You talk about specifically what happens in the interaction of that channel when an error is returned, a non-null error is returned. And then a similar thing here. Um, we talk about what happens with the wait group, which I'll touch on in a second. We talk about what happens when that wait group will be done. We talk about what happens with the generator functions channel. We talk about what happens with the generator functions internal go routine that interacts on that channel. That one's very important. And then finally, I've talked a ton about documentation. That part is over now. You don't have to read as much. I will focus a lot more on writing code. But this little point right there, don't let Godoc be empty. That's very important. It's kind of heartbreaking when I go to a Godoc page and see nothing. I just see a bunch of function declarations. That's really great. Godoc is an amazing tool. When I don't have, code, uh, when I don't have documentation, I usually click into the functions. I look at the code. I understand how the library is working. But that takes on the order of 10 times more. It's an order of magnitude longer for me to understand how to use a library than it would if there was simple documentation. It doesn't even have to be as much as this or this, but just a little hint. What's going to happen with the channels? When do I have ownership? So on and so forth. That means the world. Just keep that in mind if you're writing any kind of reusable code at all, even if it's inside of your company, uh, even if it's code that you don't think might be reusable or will be reusable, it still is very important even for yourself as you come back three days later. So on to wait group. Um, a common use for wait group is to just notify when something's done. It's a good way to gather a bunch of Go routines together, as we all know, know when they're all finished. That's common, we know that. There's a couple other things that I've used it for before. Um, I list them here. The last one is underappreciated, in my opinion. Um, when you are writing tests on functions or functionality that has a lot of concurrency going on, it's very useful to be able to make those tests deterministic. It sucks writing go test twice, having one failure and one success. Um, 
I'll touch on a little, more, a little bit more how to do this, but when you have a test that waits for a weight group to be done before it continues doing its testing, that can be very, very useful for you as a test writer and obviously very useful for me as the test runner. So pretty simple explanation here. Sorry, pretty simple code example here. Um, this is just notification inside of a for select loop, uh, really just a for loop, endless inside of a go routine. Um, it notifies the caller of start loop when the first thing has been done in the, in the loop. So you can imagine this might be good in the test. If this is doing, for instance, some IO, making an HTTP request to your handler or something like that, it can be really nice in the test for you to wait group dot wait. Once the wait has returned, you're done. The first iteration of the loop is finished. Now you can check your handler. You can figure out, did it pass the right body? Is the body a JSON decodable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's instead of just time sleeping in your test and hoping that the test, the sleep will, re uh, will return after the first iteration of that loop has completed. In that case, you're relying on the scheduler to schedule this go routine before your time sleep is up and a few other things, so on and so forth. So now I'm gonna move on. This is a little bit more complicated example. Uh, we all know about Fanon. If you don't know about Fanon, I really highly encourage you to go read uh, Rob's talk here about concurrency. It's around slide 28. I think it's 28 through 32 or 33. You can just go to that link. Um, Fanon is a really, really powerful tool because it's a very, very easy way to understand how to do concurrency. We know Go is very good at concurrency. If you can do it, if, you're, if the semantics of your program allows it, you should do it. There's no excuse not to. I define fan in here, though, as both a code pattern that is shown in, in Rob's talk and I'll show in a second, but also it's a series of steps that you can follow to take your sequential code and convert it into concurrent code. So uh, there's another section that's really good under the uh, Go blog. You can read uh, under the fan out, fan in section of pipelines. Um, Really what Fanon boils down to here though is it's a weight group and a few channels. You put those two together in the right way, it's pretty understandable. So we'll start with our, our poor function that doesn't really do any kind of current computation. If imagine we just have a data store. Uh, we simulate the data store here by sleeping for a random number of milliseconds up to a second and then we just return a random integer. I'll prove to you that this does stuff, uh, it takes a while. This might be the demo effect. Nope, okay. Uh, so yeah, you know, we did a bunch of random integers. We took about five seconds, so that's about right. We slept randomly. Okay, now there's a lot of bold here. This is, these are the things we've changed in order to A, do this concurrently, and B, keep our public exported interface the same. So if you follow along here, uh, that first function is just a utility. I basically added it so I can fit all the code on the slide. We're getting a weight group that ha adds 10 to it after we create it. Uh, and before we return it, we're getting a chan of int. Um, once we go into our loop, we're doing the same thing. We're doing 10 data store queries. Uh, inside of each loop, we make a channel. Our new data store get function now takes in a channel and closes it after it sends the result back from the channel. So again, we're doing our random sleep to simulate our data store function. We're sending the result back, but the key here is the close signal. Remember I mentioned that before? It comes in handy here. We, we spawn a new little go routine to wait for our guy to be done and pass it back to the main channel, the main channel being CH, the top. Um, and then after we exit all of our loops, and actually there's a little bug here, uh, I should have passed the C into here, apologies for that. Um, at the end of our whole deal, we have one go routine that's waiting for all the guys to be done, that's waiting this WG wait, and then we close our main channel. Closing the main channel now, it allows us to have a pretty simple range here. The range will stop as we know once CH gets closed. Um, and pretty simple, when we get each integer back, regardless of the order in which they come back, we put them into our slice and now we can return them just the same as we did before. So bug and all, let's run this. So now we did our 10 in a little under a second. Um, the bug effect here is that we're always probably, we're most likely gonna be listening on the wrong channel. Actually, I take that back if we're not because it's enclosed in the loop. Sorry. Demo effect again. But in my brain this time. <laughs> um, okay, so that's fan in, fan out. There's kind of a little group, uh, list of steps. Uh, when I go back here, 
when I see something like this, when I see some IO, for instance, almost always is IO. When I see IO happening inside of a loop, it's sequential. I immediately just start to look at my lips and I go, okay, we can write a little bit more code here, but we get this huge speed up. We got on the, an order of magnitude speed up here, a 5x speed up. Uh, when I run this in go max prox equals four, it's about an order of magnitude. Um, that's really great. This is not that much more code to get that done. So do it. I'm gonna move on to production issues. Um, this will be pretty similar to the, the fan in, fan out, but we're talking now about long running systems, okay? Issues are always gonna happen in long running systems. We have flaky hardware, we're running in the cloud potentially, uh, we've got bad networks, we're sending all across the internet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Disks, whatever. Um, some bigger shops, or you if you're really, really ambitious, you'll be able to write some infrastructure to test long running systems. That's actually something we're working on right now at Iron. If you have that infrastructure, use it. Test your long running systems, whatever language they're written in. See what happens long term. Try to put way more data than it expects into it. Try and crash one of the nodes, et cetera, et cetera. But even if you can't, Here's some ways to be proactive in your program to try and fail it gracefully, try and make it a little bit more, more robust to those issues. So first of all, timeouts. Uh, this is a really, really uh, trivial program that I wrote to illustrate this. It's like starting a Go routine that listens on a channel that never gets sent on and then waiting for that channel. Um, the reason I wrote it though is to illustrate here that if, if you don't time out on channel waits in your real production system, you might end up in something like this. This is kind of crappy to see if you have your little log aggregator at 2 a.m., you have to wake up and you see this. It's just like, I could have prevented that. In my, I always think that in my head, that could have been prevented. An easy way to overcome it, just do a select. Remember selects, they're really nice. Just select on that channel and select on a timer. Two cases in your select and make the timer something reasonable. Have it time out after a second. A second's a long time, but at least it's not this. There's also one better we can do, and that is net.context. Uh, there's a blog post uh, on the Golang blog, apologies for not including the link to it here, um, but it's a big blog post on why net.context, why Google uses it, why Google created it, and how Google uses it. Very great blog post, just Google for it. Google's pretty easy to find. Um, uh, I kind of cheated here though in my advocation for net context uh, because in the, the uh, talk description I said that everything would be done in the standard library. This is not in the standard library, it'd be really cool if it was, but it's not. Um, but you could build it in the standard library in like a couple hours maybe, and that would include tests. Um, it's so important here, in my experience, it's so important that I'm putting it in this talk even though I have to make excuses to do that. So here's the interface, uh, copyright and all. I hope I got that right, guys. Um, so I took out all the comments. The comments are excellent. This is another good example for how to write comments. Um, but essentially, this, is, this context interface can be constructed in multiple different ways. You can have a context that never sends undone. It's called a background context. You can have a context that you can cancel, and then it will send undone. You can have a context that can time out, or you can cancel it. Uh, and most importantly here is that you can build a tree out of these contexts. You can create a cancellation context out of another context that if the first context, the parent of the tree is canceled, then the child of the tree will also be canceled. You can imagine how in a large code, large code base, that would really be nice to represent caller and callee relationships. So let's talk about contexts as they might be in a distributed system. Uh, there is a Jeff Dean talk. I originally saw it at Recon 2013. He wrote a paper on it, I think beforehand. Uh, it's behind a paywall, so I couldn't include the link. Um, it talks about a lot of practical things about how they run distributed systems at Google. You might imagine those are big distributed systems that they've run for a long time, so it's a pretty good guy to listen to. Um, one of the interesting parts of this paper slash talk is called Hedge Requests. Um, Hedge requests are on the cover pretty simple. You just do a bunch of get requests that are, they don't have side effects, they, they're idempotent, they don't do anything to a data store, so on and so forth. You do a bunch of them to a bunch of backends that are all identical, and when the first one returns, the simplified version, you just cancel all the rest of them. You get a lot more I.O., obviously, if you're running that backend over a network, it's a lot more network. 
He has a really good study that they did in real, in real life on how it affects network, what the trade-off is between the network and the speed of their services and the long tail. Um, encourage you to look at that. Um, Rob showed a pretty good variant of that in the same concurrency patterns. You can see a theme here. Um, he, on slide 50 of that same concurrency patterns talk. Uh, encourage you to go look at that. I'm going to add on to that one extra part, which is the cancellation. So remember here, we talked about making a bunch of GET requests. It's great. You can just grab the first one that comes back. But what about the other ones? If the backends that you're doing the GET on are consuming resources, then it would be nice to be able to cancel them. If, for instance, they're doing some crypto or they're accessing another backend or they're doing a scan on disk or something like that, if you're able to cancel them, you could potentially be saving a lot of resource. So here's what it looks like adding cancellation using net context. Uh, let me just run this first. So what this, is, what this is doing, it's saying, I will give you, on the third line there, I will give you 10 milliseconds to get something done. We're going to start up 10 little getters here in Go Routines. Uh, get is a simulation of a, a network call. It's going to sleep for some random amount of time less than or equal to 100 milliseconds. Uh, and then it's going to send back on CH, on channel, it's going to send back its result, which is just a random integer. So you can see in this, this first little part, there's a chance that we might, might not get anything back. And by the way, the random number generators and all this are actually seeded with the current time. So we will actually get results back. So we're getting our results back, no result. Now we get a result. Now we get no result, get results. So you can see that sort of non-determinism. What would you do in a system like this if you start getting no results back? Well, you could do one or two things. You could wait for longer, which is just a little config value. We'll plug it into whatever config system you want. Or you can increase the number of gets. Both have trade-offs, but both are tunable. There's no extra code you have to write. If you do this right, you don't have to deploy any new code at all. You can just tune a value here and there. And then again, at the end here, to read the way that we're outputting this output, uh, we've got our little select. We're either waiting on the channel to return from one of those, or we're waiting on the done. So the done will get sent after 10 milliseconds. One of these will happen before the other. And it, once that happens, we do our little print, and then we die. Additionally, the get function will also listen on context done. If it gets a context done, it stops and it closes. It's, that's it. The Go routine is dead. But there's a lot more we can do that he talks about in his talk and paper. Um, one of the things he talks about is waiting until a 95th percentile latency and then start sending the other requests. That's when the alarms go off. That's when you should start trying to get other things. Um, you can do that pretty easily with two contexts. One context for the first one and for that first get and have that context be set to the 95th percentile latency. If that context fires, it's done and you haven't gotten a result back, create another context that's cancelable. Once you create the cancelable context, you can now issue that to n other gets. Once you've done that, if one of those returns, you're good. If not, now it's time to wake up at 2 a.m. or do something better. Hopefully do something better. Um, the second thing, obviously we talked about canceling in-flight requests. Well, he goes a step further and talks about sending the cancellation all the way, to, all the way down to the back end that the back end calls. Very simple. You just pass the context or some representation thereof across the wire if you're doing a network call or down to a subsystem if you're doing it that way. The context can, be go, can go anywhere inside of a Go program and it always acts the same. It will always send on that done channel when the timeout happens or when it's canceled. And remember, we can build trees of it so the guy who receives it, if it's a back end, that I've been calling it a back end, if the back end receives it, he can choose how long he wants to wait. And that's completely independent from the guy who called that back end. And then finally, this one I find pretty interesting. Um, he talks about target-to-target -target communication. So if I'm sending out to 10 different backends, I can also send those backends some information about all the other guys who I've asked. And those backends can coordinate amongst themselves. He doesn't detail how, but you can imagine some possible coordination algorithm that's going on back there. Those guys say, hey, I'm done. I'm going to tell all the other guys, in this case, all other nine guys that I'm done, and they shouldn't bother anymore. They can actually cancel each other. And you can obviously imagine we've got this context tool. Each one of those guys can create their own context and send it to the other guys. So now they all know about each other. Now they can all cancel each other. Now we don't have to send those extra network calls over the wire to cancel the remaining nine because they just do it themselves. 
And finally, uh, putting all these ideas together, um, we talked about weight groups, we talked about channels, we talked about our force, uh, we talked about not force select loops yet. Um, we talked about context. Force select loops are a way that I've seen to put them all together, and they can be very powerful when you put all these concepts together. So first of all, what are they? Uh, you can do a lot of things with force select loops. You can, run a go, uh, you can run an event loop or multiple event loops in different guard teams. You can do some kind of cleanup. This is not go garbage collection, but it could potentially be compacting a log or uh, recycling connections or so on and so forth. Um, you can even do things like uh, simulate an actor. Uh, it may not be a very popular thing to do, uh, but you can do it. You can have a channel that you send to mutate state and it can receive to get the result of the mutation and so on and so forth. So the mechanics, you run a big loop in a go routine. It's pretty simple at the, at the top. Um, inside the loop, this is the select part of the four select. You select on two or more channels for each iteration. When you get a result, a send for one of those channels, you do something and you send the result back to somewhere. It doesn't have to be the caller to the sender of the channel, but it can be. And then sometimes four select operations can pass on the work that they receive to another guy and potentially pass a context down to that guy or a channel, for instance, that will return a result back to the original asker, if you will, of the work. So before I get into the code, a few patterns here. Um, again, for testability, it's very nice to have an ACK system. Uh, in your four select loop, it's going to be running forever, but it may not be very introspectable. Uh, it's very nice if you ask the four select loop to do some work, it may respond before the work is done, but it can be very useful, especially for your testing, uh, but also for some things like, like I say, rate limiting and back pressure. It can be very useful to have an ACK. So for example, in testing, let's take that as a simple example. You submit your work to be done. It responds to you saying, I started, but you have an external channel or an external weight group potentially that will be done or be sent on once the work is done, maybe once it's started, maybe with some progress indication, and your tests can follow along to make sure A, progress is being made, B, the right result has been <coughs> sent back, C, it's been done in a reasonable amount of time, so on and so forth. Same thing if your force select loop is some kind of an event loop or a timer. Uh, if you're ticking, then you want to make sure to wrap your ticker in an ACK. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, Probably by now you know I'm a big fan of net context, so you probably want to use that for, net, for cancellation. Um, again, with these signals, for the last point here, it's very nice to have signals. Again, once your loop is started, and most importantly, once it's stopped. Um, in production, for instance, if you have a long-running select loop, uh, per perhaps it's doing something in the background as the result of getting some requests from an HTTP server. It'd be really nice to know if that loop is stopped, because your HTTP server may still be responding to requests, the real work is not being done anymore. So it'd be nice to crash the server, send an alarm, whatever. So here's an example of a polar. Uh, we do a lot of queuing at RMQ, so this would be a pretty good example for us. Uh, this is excerpt from some code that we have. Uh, this is a four select loop. You can see inside of a go routine, we have our four and we've got our select. Um, this little guy is a simulation of a DQ. So we're polling the queue every five milliseconds and we're dequeuing some data, just says element with a random integer on it, on the end there. And we're just doing that until we get our done. So if we get our done, we're in the middle of a dequeue, the next time we're not gonna do any more dequeues. Uh, you can imagine, extrapolate this out to any number of operations that need to be repeated. Checking a file, checking a timer, uh, sending a message, doing cron, whatever. So there could be a lot of different things here. A few other extra notes here. Um, we've got two signals. We've got one for start, and actually we have two for end here. Uh, and I'll explain what the deal is with both of those. Um, we've got our two weight groups, one for start and end. We've got our channel that we're listening on. We've also closing that channel when the four select loop dies. Uh, so for, if for any reason this four loop dies, it doesn't look like it might here, but you might be able to, uh, you, you might end up adding something to it later, or so on and so forth. Uh, both the channel will be closed and the weight group will be done. Those are two very useful signals that you may want to use. And then here's the little driver that I wrote for the polar. This one's actually runnable. Um, you can see here, we're just going again. We're setting up 10 different polars. Um, we're waiting for the polar to start. We're consuming from the polar's channel. Um, and 
when we're done consuming from the channel, we're done. Here, we're just doing the same thing, but for all the polars, we're fanning them all in again. And then here, since I didn't have enough room, print chan is just that range over the main channel. Once it's done, once the range returns, uh, we're done. It just prints out everything until it's done. So here's our result from doing this run for 10 milliseconds. Uh, we've just dequeued de a bunch of stuff until 10 milliseconds are up. Fairly straightforward, fairly, fairly simple. The real power here is in our four select loop. I've seen these things get expanded out to like 18 case statements, uh, each one of which is responding to a signal from some other go routine, uh, responding to a ticker, something else. There's a million different things going on here. One of them I even saw, it was trying to add randomness by uh, modding the Unix nano time by six or eight or something like that. I don't know why, but it did it. And it's pretty easy to add in. It's just add another case statement. So then a couple of notes about this polar. Um, I didn't put the ACK in for each individual operation. If you go back here, each individual DQ operation, we don't have an ACK for it. You can imagine the ACK might be easily done with a channel send. Um, but we also have a utility at iron uh, that adds ACKs to timer, uh, well, to timers and to tickers and a few other things. Uh, those ACKs are implemented basically as just passing a funk across the channel and the guy in the, um, in the selic, uh, it will just call the funk. Whatever happens in the funk happens, doesn't matter. The only contract is the funk will never block. Um, that allows us to stub out different, um, different tickers and timer implementations. It allows us to do counters in the funk to count number of acts. It allows us to gather statistics and so on and so forth. Um, I'm leaving that as an exercise to the reader, uh, but we might be open sourcing something fairly soon. Um, and then I'm just going to wrap up. Um, so Go has some pretty good concurrency stuff. We all know that. We've all seen it. I hope here that uh, I've just kind of illustrated some better patterns on top of those. Um, maybe not better, but some patterns to think about at least on top of those. Um, and I think that with things like this, more talks like this, if you guys can give them, um, with more posts on new patterns, things like this, I think we're going to finally start building some new patterns and conventions on top of the great stuff we already have in Go. Um, and I really, really look forward to seeing that. So uh, let's just see here. Use net.context. And this, this uh, talk that I referenced is Rob's talk. It's called Go Concurrency, Program, uh, Go Concurrency Patterns. I uh, really encourage you guys to go check that out. And that's it. Thank you. We have time again for like two questions. something like I prototype it, I do the simple way. And it's really slow. It takes 10 seconds or something like that. Um, premature optimization. We know about premature optimization. Um, root of all evil and all that stuff. I wouldn't go and make something more complicated until you know the profile and you've seen that it's slow. If you find that you're really not doing that much IO and it really doesn't take that long, don't do it. That's pretty much as simple as that. Does that answer your question? It's a, it's a tough call to make because, yeah, it added it triple the size of the code or thereabouts. I, I guess I was wondering, like, how, what is your decision process? Um, so my decision process really is just data driven. I just go in and I profile. I say, are these data store calls A necessary? And B, how long are they taking relative to the rest of my program? Um, it's a tough call to make to add more code, but my hope is that that pattern is recognizable enough to look across all the code base and see, hey, I know what this is doing. I know how this should look, and I can understand it. It's kind of the best I can do for you. Yeah. Okay, thank you.